All right, all right. What's cooking, everybody? Tim Harridge here. Welcome to the monthly update for November of 2020. So today, we're just going to go through some quick hits, a market overview. Then we've got a nice long discussion with Rick Sharga, the executive vice president of Realty Track. Realty Track is one of those leading data providers. And Rick Sharga, you've probably heard me talk about him before and talk with him before, is really tied into the foreclosure market and just real estate trends as a whole. Then we'll have some Q&A. The Q&A will not be live, but we're going to ask you to please just ask comments in the questions of the questions area of either YouTube or Facebook, wherever you're watching this video or on my blog, and we'll get those questions answered as they come in. So credit where credit is due, realtytrack.com, nar.realtor, that's where you can access the monthly market sales information, and then timherridge.com, obviously that's my uh, home base, if you will. All right, market overview, what is going on? During so when you look at year over year numbers, here we are in September, month supply, hit an all a 12 month low uh, which you heard me talk last month and you'll hear me talk later with Rick this lack of supply coupled with low interest rates it's what's really fueling this seller's market we find ourselves in here's some regional data the regional data is just really important as you look at percent change in sales one year ago and you think about where you are in the United States, specifically look at the low price bands, the 250 and below. Um, you know, really the Midwest has seen a healthy growth of percent sales in the 100 to 250. But when you look, you look at the zero to $100,000 market, it's basically, I mean, in essence, it's disappeared. And that's because prices are still going up, mainly driven by low interest rates and lack of supply. So we are solid in a seller's market and I don't see it changing anytime soon. And you look at the inventory available, it is down across the board since the last year, with the exception of when you start getting into the 750,000 to a million dollar price range. And even in some markets, that is still down in double digits if you look at the million dollars on the West Coast. Market conditions, this is just a year over year look at what happened in September versus what happened in September of last year. Um, the, the dark red is September 2020, the light red is September 2019. Um, first time home buyer sales percentage down year over year. Sales to investors year over year down. Cash sales year over year up by 1%. Distress sales year over year down by 1%. And days on the market down uh, significantly over 30%. So again, you start looking at sales by price range. You see that it is becoming increasingly difficult to find a home for less than $250,000. And the 250 to 500 price range is now making up 41% of all sales nationwide, uh, followed by the 100 to 250. That affordable housing, uh, you know, a couple years ago, we probably wouldn't have said 250,000 was affordable, but that's affordable now. And uh, when you look at replacement cost and cost of building materials, which Rick and I are gonna talk a lot about later, you'll kind of understand a little bit more why. And then you look at the median home price of existing sales. It is up in September and continues to climb. We had the dip when a uh, little seasonality dip and then the COVID dip, but since then, it has just constantly been going up. Year over year, total existing home sales percent change. Obviously, we had the dip in, uh, it, it was still up in March, but then down significantly in April, really down in May, still down in June. Again, that's you know mainly oct uh, May oct activity, but then up 8% in July, up 10% year over year in August, and then up a whopping almost 21% in September. And then when you look at the median price year over year, you see that even though activity was way down in May and June, the price, the median price was still up. And then you see in July, the median price increase year over year got to 9% and then 11% and then a whopping 15%. So what we're seeing is inventory compression and interest rate compression, which is fueling price growth. And, um, you know, that I, I just, I feel like that's, that's here to stay, but we're going to talk a lot about this with Rick Sharga coming up. 
Just a quick reminder, some of my platforms, besthomebuyers.com, a place that you can list your home, buying business for free, and uh, you can backlink to your website and really build your organic search engine optimization. REI Choice Insurance, we are the number one real estate investor insurance company in the nation. We insure more than $150 million worth of real estate investment property nationwide among nearly a thousand clients. If you have not checked us out, hop on over to reichoice.com, instantequity.com. It's where I sell all of my wholesale inventory. It's free to use. You can join our buyers list there and you can post any properties that you would like to sell to an investor at a discount. And then InvestorWell, real estate investor funding made easy. It's the place where we connect you with the capital that I use for my business. And it's all online. It's simple to qualify and fix and flip rates start uh, around 8% and long-term 30-year fixed financing, which is gonna be key as we continue to build towards inflation events, um, is starting in the 4% range. So those are just some of my companies. If you like what I do, check them out. You support them, you support me. I keep doing these kind of things. Next, I'm gonna be joined by Rick Sharga. Rick is the Executive Vice President of Realty Track. Many of you know him from his time consulting at CJ Patrick. He was also the executive vice president and chief marketing officer at auction.com and 10 X. Rick is a very, very smart person. He is someone that I turn to when I have a question or when I want to cut through the noise of the market. Um, so I'm happy to have Rick on. We're going to join Rick now. That's how you can connect with him. We'll provide these links again at the end of the show, but, for now, let's join Rick. Hello, everyone. Tim Harridge here again with my good friend, Rick Sharga. Rick is the executive vice president of Realty Track. And don't tell him I said this, one of the smartest guys I know. He is someone I've always enjoyed hearing speak at conferences. And uh, he takes an interesting approach to market conditions and problems that I always find um, to be rather accurate. Uh, so we'll see what he has for us today. Uh, I've asked him to come on, talk to us about the coming foreclosure wave that will rival the zombie foreclosures that we've still never seen and uh, the housing markets, low interest rates, housing policy, et cetera. So Rick, welcome. Nice to be here, Tim. Always good to talk to you and, and, uh, you and, and compare barbecue notes, if nothing else. <laughs> well, we're not talking football because you're an Eagles fan and I'm a Cowboys fan and there's no football in the NFC East this year. I, is there an NFC East this year? <laughs> I, well, there is. And I think they should all have to stop using their nicknames just like Washington did. Like they should all have to call themselves the Dallas football team, the Philadelphia football team, the New York football team, and the Washington football team. And they should not be able to use their nicknames until they actually earn it again. I could not agree with you more. <laughs> well, man, um, I've been reading some articles you've been sharing on Twitter. And so if you're on this call and you're listening, look Rick Sharga up on Twitter. I'll put it on the screen here in just a minute. Uh, he shares a lot of good housing data and research and articles that are uh, a lot from Housing Wire, a lot from the, the stuff that they do at Realty Track. And um, it, it, I like it because it's typically data-driven and um, uh, insightful versus a knee-jerk kind of prediction, which there's way too much of going on right now. Yeah. Rick, let's start with foreclosures. Uh, you were the uh, EVP and Chief Marketing Officer of Auction.com, so you obviously have a lot going there. You did work at Carrington and some of these other large uh, NPL-type places. Um, why don't you just talk a little bit about the uh, current delinquency rates you're seeing, what you're hearing is going to happen, and kind of what you're thinking the foreclosure market will look like in the coming three, six, nine, 12 months. So how, how many days do we have to record this? <laughs> um, cliff notes, cliff notes. They can cliff find notes. you so, on Twitter to learn the rest. There we go. So just to put it in perspective, historically, about 1% of loans in any given year are in some stage of foreclosure. <clears throat> Excuse me, about 4% of loans are in some stage of delinquency, but not in foreclosure. During the Great Recession, uh, we had four times more loans in foreclosure, about 4%, and we had a, about 12% of loans that were delinquent. So those, those were really historically high levels that we've never seen before or since. There are people that are concerned that what we're seeing right now is a precursor to a similar wave of delinquencies and foreclosures. 
I, I tend to be on the opposite side of that argument. And, and uh, the headlines that you're reading today might lead you to question uh, whether we might actually be looking at another foreclosure tsunami. Um, we're looking at serious delinquency rates for loans that are the highest they've been since 2009, 2010. Uh, back during the teeth of the, of the Great Recession. But the reason I'm not as alarmed about that uh, is, is twofold. One, overall delinquency rates are actually going down right now. So we, we went through a, uh, an historically brutal uh, and, and very fast hitting recession. Not surprisingly, we saw delinquency rates go up, but we're starting to see them go down and new delinquencies are going down faster than anything else. The loans that are really seriously delinquent, if you don't follow the industry, you're, you're likely to take a look at them and get the wrong impression. Um, seriously delinquent in the industry is anything that's more than 90 days past due. But we have this forbearance program that the government put in place, which gives people in many cases up to a year to miss mortgage payments. And even though they're not technically listed as being delinquent on their loans, the industry is measuring the loans as being past due. So when you start to see people being 90, 120, 150, 180 days past due on a loan, these are all people that are in the forbearance program. And when they come out of the forbearance program, they and agree to a repayment plan with their, with their lender, they immediately go from seriously delinquent to current on their loans. And that's a very different circumstance than we've ever seen before in the lending industry. Usually if you get 120 days past due, you're going to lose your house to foreclosure. It, there's very few people that actually come back from that successfully. The other thing to, to point out there, Tim, is that the, the Mortgage Bankers Association uh, and Black Knight are both tracking what happens to people when they leave forbearance. And the last MBA report that came out last week showed that since June, when people first started exiting the forbearance program through November, about 12% exited without a plan in place. So they didn't have a repayment plan, they didn't have a loan modification, their loan wasn't reinstated, so they were kind of in limbo. But that means that 88% of the people that are exiting are doing so successfully. So if, if we really manage to only have 12% of the people in the program at risk, the number that actually do wind up going into default should be a very manageable number. And on the foreclosure side, we entered this pandemic with about a half a percent of loans in foreclosure, which was a half of what we normally expect to see historically. I think it's possible that as unemployment has, has gone up, you could see maybe twice that many loans in foreclosure because the unemployment rates about twice what it was before the pandemic. That gets us back up to historical averages. Uh, even if you doubled that, you would still be running at about half the rate you were during the Great Recession. And it won't all happen at once because as people come out of this forbearance program I was just talking about, even if they come out without a plan in place, they're not gonna technically be delinquent for another 90 or 120 days. And then each state's foreclosure laws kick in. So if you happen to get a, a a notice of default in Texas, you're probably gonna be cleared out in the next six to nine months and, and through a foreclosure. If it's in New York, it could be three or four years. Right. So we'll, we'll see things happen at different rates across the country, but uh, I think it's inevitable. We'll see more defaults, we'll see more foreclosures, but I don't think it's gonna be anything like what we saw back in 2008 to 2011. Now I want to talk. I'll talk a little bit about supply and demand in a minute, but I just want to kind of go back over some stuff. So you said this. The the interesting thing is the forbearances are included in a lot of the industry delinquency stats, but like you said, they're not really delinquent. Right. The the borrowers have been excused from making payments as long as they're in an agreement like that with with their mortgage servicer. Um, the the CARES Act stipulates that those borrowers credit. Uh, can't be pinged or can't be dinged because they're they're taking advantage of the program, but the industry still keeping track of who's making payments on which loans. So when you see these huge delinquency numbers being being bandied about, 100% of the loans that are in that forbearance program that haven't made a payment in all those months are included in those numbers, and and that's why the numbers I believe are artificially inflated, 
because they're they're as people again as people are exiting the program they're reinstating their loans uh 20 percent of the people that are in the program have never missed a payment even though they haven't had to make a payment so the 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 performance of the people in that program uh is stronger than you would expect and the program is doing exactly what it was designed to do it's giving people who either are in financial distress or who are afraid their finances might go sideways because of COVID, the opportunity to, to avoid an unnecessary default. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, I mean, half a percent just isn't anything near what we saw. And I would imagine that right now, anyone that is in forbearance, I mean, almost everybody has enough equity in their house where now they could actually sell if they did come off forbearance without a payment plan and the lender, lender got aggressive. I mean, uh, I mean, is that what yeah, you're, you're seeing? You're, you're spot on. See, this is why I like talking to you because you understand this stuff and you, you feed me questions that you know I know the answer to. Um, <laughs> well, I so, sell a lot of houses and, and, and I I, when I sell them, and I've been telling people this for the last two or three, maybe four years, I'm not seeing you know, cowboy mortgages. I'm not seeing ninja loans. I'm not seeing, uh, bear, you know, down payment assistance where they're handing someone the 3% so they can give it to the bank. I'm seeing 5%, 10%, 20% down. And so you just do the reverse math, right? Before with hundred percent financing market takes a dip when people didn't even have enough money to buy it. It makes a lot of sense that if they have to sell, they can't, but yeah. now it's, I don't know if there's a house I've sold in the last almost decade now that they wouldn't have enough equity to sell it. They may not make a bunch of money out of it, but at least avoid a foreclosure. Yeah, huge, huge difference this time around. And, and you just, you hit it right on the head, Tim. There's a record level of homeowner equity right now. The last report I saw <clears throat> was about two months ago and it was $6.5 trillion in equity. And I, I'm sure that number has gone up because home prices continue to go up. Um, Adam Data, who's Realty Track's parent company, just put out a report. I was digging through the data. 70% of homeowners have more than 20% equity in their homes. So this is not this weird scenario we had last time where you have some people with a lot of equity and most people with no equity. 70% have at least 20% equity. Black Knight took a look at the people in forbearance, even the people that are, have stopped paying their mortgages. 90% uh, of them had more than 10% equity. So there, there is a small group of people uh, who might be affected by, by the pandemic recession. Uh, I, I look at FHA borrowers over the last maybe two, three, four years. So these are people that probably took out a loan with a 3.5% down payment and may not have had the home long enough to really build up an equity cushion that would give them a, a comfortable escape if they had to sell a house. But I believe the same thing you do. I believe one of the big differences this time is that the majority of people who find themselves in stress have the opportunity to sell the house off in order to avoid a foreclosure. That was not the case 10 years ago. Uh, right now we have more demand than we have supply available. That's being driven by historically low interest rates. It's being, being driven by demographics. Millennials are, the biggest group of millennials are now approaching that age for first time home buyer, uh, uh, that, that first time home buyer time. Um, so between demographics, uh, lower interest rates, and the fact that we're now seeing an acceleration of people moving uh, out of renting in the city into owning a home in the suburbs because of the pandemic, all those things factor into demand. The market has not been building enough uh, to accommodate that demand. We've been short, depending on whose numbers you believe, by anywhere from 300 to 400,000 units a year. So there's ready demand, historically low interest rates, uh, and people with equity. And to me, that's a combination that says anybody with 20% equity who loses a house to foreclosure is doing something wrong. <laughs> right. So you may, and I, and, and I want to be clear to anyone. Go, you may have people go into default, but they don't have to lose their home to foreclosure. Right. And I want to be clear to anyone listening right now, we're sp speaking primarily and almost solely on single family. And I will yes. touch a little on multifamily and commercial in a minute. But so I was looking at the NAR data. I told you I was trying to do some of this data myself the last couple months. And when you look at the price bands of homes and the percent of sales, you know, the FHA price band, the sub 400,000 
is virtually gone in America, yeah. right? Yep. And, and when you look at the month's demand in uh, the attrition rate in those markets, it's something we've never seen before. I mean, in Dallas, Fort Worth, homes below $200,000, there's less than a one month supply of those. So yeah. like one of the, you said 20, 70% have 20% equity, right? So even if they took a 10% dip, in prices, right? Which we didn't even really see that in most markets in the Great Recession. Even if you took a 10% immediate hit and they had to pay 18, 8% in closing costs with realtors and title fees, they've still got 2% to play with. Yeah. And, so, and, and, and prices continue to go up. So the, the reality is in almost every market in the country, if you put a property up on online or up, up for sale and price it at, accurately, you're going to wind up with multiple bids. So very, very unlikely you're going to see a lot of discounting. I, people ask about short sales, which you didn't, but comes up in conversation a lot. Um, I really don't see a boom in short sales anytime soon, simply because that's, that's strictly a negative equity position. And why on earth would a bank approve a short sale at this point, uh, knowing that there's going to be multiple bidders on a property? So it's the, the market dynamics really weigh against a huge wave of foreclosure activity right uh and and certainly weigh against foreclosures being prevalent enough to cause another drop off in, in pricing yeah and in and, and, you know some of the nar data has just been really interesting so like the uh, sub 250 price ban is up 10 percent year over year in september <laughs> and yeah i'm one of those uh i'm definitely not a uh conspiracy theorist, right? But if we're up 10% year over year in the midst of the greatest pandemic to ever hit the United States in our lifetime, uh, I, I'd imagine that with now what three viable vaccines, we're going to be okay moving forward is, is my, <laughs> my this is, this has been This has been a weird recession, Tim, um, to say, to put it mildly. Um, we have... We have a dichotomy in the workforce. So the people that have been hit the hardest are in a handful of different industries, retail, restaurants, hospitality, travel, tourism, entertainment. Those tend to be people that don't earn a ton of money, uh, often hourly employees. They tend to be younger. They tend to have less formal education. And because of that, they tend to have very low home ownership rates. Your, your white collar, higher salaried workers haven't been hit as hard by the unemployment numbers. They're the people more likely to be out buying houses. And because interest rates are at, you know, 2.75% for a 30 year fixed rate loan, they're taking advantage of the situation right now. And they are able to offset the increased prices by having lower monthly payments. Uh, NAR and the California Association both put out numbers in August talking about July, July prices. And in both cases, we had a record high, both nationally and in California for the median prices. And in both cases, the average monthly mortgage payment was lower than it was the prior year. Now there, there's a limit to how far the, that interest rate benefit will, will carry. You can't have 10 and 15% price increases every month and have it sustainable. And, and we won't, by the way, because at some point you'll hit an affordability wall and, it, and people will bounce back. But that's what's partly that's what's happening. Partly what you said is making the price inflation look worse than it is. There's nothing at the low end to buy. There's nothing at the low right. end to buy. So the product mix that goes into people reporting these numbers has all skewed toward higher price properties. So it's not that the two hundred fifty thousand dollar house is now worth two hundred seventy five thousand. It's that there's no two hundred fifty thousand dollar houses on the market. Right. So the median price is dictated by higher priced homes being sold. And it makes the numbers a little fuzzy. Yeah, because some of the NAR data uh, talks about the percentage of sales in a certain price band. And it goes, breaks it down by region. And it's something I've been saying for the longest point of time, uh, the dynamics of the economy and wages and yep. you know personal wealth in this, country has made it where the people that own a $250,000 house in Garland, Texas, you know, my backyard, they can't sell 
because unless they're downsizing or moving out of town because mm -hmm. they can't buy a nicer home for less than 250,000. They can't right. buy a smaller home for less than 250,000. So it, it, it's one of those, it's, it, it's been, it, it's, it's almost like uh, the middle class has been significantly suppressed by the dynamics in this inventory shortage, in my opinion. The lower middle so, class, the upper middle I, class. I, I, I think I think you're 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 right. There's at the at the entry level of the market, almost no inventory available. Uh, Fannie Mae says, <clears throat> on average, costs a builder eighty thousand dollars before they break ground on a new house. California, that's a hundred thousand. Lumber costs have been up. Labor cost is up. Uh, even their capital cost, to a certain extent, is up because investors know they're going to be sitting on on that investment for a while before the, the project gets done. Um, so it's really hard for them to build that inventory. And then if you're in that entry level inventory, there's not a lot available for you that's an easy move up. You you might not go for it used to go from 250 to maybe 350. And you go, wow, that's great. I can do that. Going from 250 to five, that's a lot harder. Uh, and, and that's kind of where the market is, that the entry level and that first move up tier are really, really tight in terms of inventory. Yeah, and I've always focused my personal investing in what I always, I was taught to call move up, move down neighborhoods. Yep. It was the neighborhood where people get married, they have their one kid, they stay in their apartment, but they get to their 2.3 children. And now it's time to get a house and a yard and a dog and a fence, right? And yep. And, and, but now those houses, I am astonished weekly when the acquisition folks in my company call me and say, we've got this house on XYZ street and it's comped at 300. And you're like, what? Uh, <laughs> and, you know, and then you run the comps and you're like, yeah, I think you maybe 315, you know? Uh, it, it, and so, it, it that move up move down market and, and you in the same market used to be really good for the people that were becoming empty nesters but still wanted to stay in a home in the city they lay you know close to town they would move into that neighborhood and now if you're trying to downsize you're not downsizing into a three hundred thousand dollar house that's not downsizing nope. Nope. so let's segue because we were just talking about lack of entry level inventory and I would say personally that if there was a crisis in the housing market, it is affordability um, because replacement cost and cost of construction with labor increases, regulation increases and, uh, you know, land, you know, the, the, the price of land and, and all of those things make it where they, it's really almost virtually impossible to build a single family home that's affordable for a first time home buyer. Um, unless they wait an extra 10 years, which I know you've talked a lot about household formation and things like that. So let's segue into, I don't want anyone to comment on this video at all and tell me the election's not over. I don't need to hear that. What I want to talk about is there is a presumptive president elect and yep. vice president elect. And if you're on this call, we've only got about 30 minutes left. So we can't go over the entire policy of the Biden Harris potential administration to avoid the conspiracy theorists. Uh, but you can go to their website and read it all. But some of the things are uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of affordable real estate that they want to create. Um, $15,000 first time home buyer tax credit. Uh, I, I haven't read it all. These are just some of the cliff notes. And I know you probably know a lot more. But then I'm gonna shut up and let you talk. It reminds me of the eight thousand dollar tax credit for first-time home buyers from was that oh eight yeah bush vote bush started it but it went into effect after the election no it was actually there were there were two and they were actually both in the obama administration i, I was wrong um, uh but hang yeah. on but, but so that's close. when were... that's when flipping got good again as an investor mm -hmm. right because there was a time frame there where it was not good at all so the, the question is for you, speaking since my audience is mainly real estate investors, what policies do you see proposed and potentially 
enacted by a new administration that would be good and bad for real estate investors? Well, you mentioned two. Why don't we talk about those first? The, the $15,000 tax credit, uh, I have categorized as a solution in search of a problem. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a tax credit that's available at the down payment stage. Uh, and, and I think creates two unintended consequences that a well-meaning um, administration has overlooked. One is we don't have a demand problem right now. We have a supply problem. The last thing we need to do is stimulate more demand and giving somebody a check for $15,000 stimulates more demand. So you're actually gonna wind up driving the price of homes higher by putting more people into a position where they need to buy something now to take advantage of a stimulus. That, that's not a good solution from my perspective. The other unintended consequence is if you can use that as your down payment, uh, you're actually probably putting less qualified borrowers into a position where they're going to buy an expensive house and maybe be more vulnerable to the next downturn economically, uh, which, which could lead to, to more defaults and more distressed property hitting the marketplace. Again, not on purpose, but I, I'm not sure people are thinking through the, the ramifications of, of that, kind of, that kind of program. The other thing I think is going to be very true is that you will see um, home buying become more expensive for the average borrower because of the affordable housing policies you talked about. The funds for those affordable homes, and these will mostly be apartments, by the way, so we should probably be careful with the terminology, those available dwellings, uh, affordable dwellings, will probably come from fees tacked onto Fannie and Freddie and maybe even FHA loans. <clears throat> so somebody's got to be paying for the money the government's going to be putting in to make apartment units more affordable. Um, but because of that, I do think you'll see an increase in demand for apartments, uh, for rental units. And if I were an investor right now, that would be an area I'd be looking at. Dem demographics also suggest that after we get through this short-term displacement because of the eviction moratoria that are in place, the rental market will probably pick up steam again. Uh, again, partly because of demographics and partly because a lot of people that are currently renters and may have been planning to buy a, ho a house soon have had to reset their financial clocks because of the recession. And so they're gonna probably be rentals, renters for a little longer than they planned. Uh, so you take that, you take all the young people who are starting to form households, you take the millennials that move back home because of the pandemic who are gonna move out again. And I think there's gonna be a huge rental demand over the next few years. Uh, and, and there will be government stimulus to kind of help facilitate uh, both the building and, and perhaps the repurposing uh, of other, other units into those kind of rental properties. I can't hear you, Tim. There. I've got on my screen, joebiden.com. Can you see it, Rick? Yep. All right. So I'm not making this up. You can go to joebiden.com slash housing and look at it. Um, I noticed several of these are modeled after California uh, laws and rules. And, uh, you know, if there was a better uh, housing... <laughs> <laughs> market to model it after. Uh, why not make the entire United States like California housing? But anyway, I won't go there. Let's just, any of these you want to <coughs> tackle for the listener. Uh, we're protecting homeowners and renters from abusive lenders like the California Homeowner Bill of Rights. Uh, uh, 15, 30, 45 seconds on that. No? <laughs> I know you weren't prepared for this. Oh. The, uh, the vice president-elect is very familiar with the California Homeowner Bill of Rights because she had a, a large role in creating it. And it was kind of, it was a, a punitive measure aimed at kind of punishing people for foreclosing back, back in the recession. Uh, and, and also put in place stipulations that servicers would have to meet in terms of providing opportunities for loan modifications. None of those were necessarily a bad thing in and of themselves, 
But the bottom line here is that there are a lot of protections already in place and very few people, relatively speaking, are being evicted from their homes uh, or, or their apartments, even before these eviction moratoria came into place. Um, I do think you will see, especially since the, the COVID infection rate has started to skyrocket again, I think you're gonna see things like foreclosure moratoria and eviction moratoria extended because of the health crisis. Um, and, and that could last through the first half of next year. Uh, would not be a big surprise to me to see that. So the next section is talking about protecting tenants from eviction. And it says Biden will also encourage localities to create eviction diversion programs, including mediation payment plans and financial literacy education programs. So I hope, um, I hope the plan doesn't look like California's because what it allows the landlord to do is not to push to collect rent right now, but afterwards, maybe take the tenant to court to see what they can collect from the tenant after the fact, uh, which, which means they'll basically be on the hook for court costs and still not be able to collect anything. Um, I think all of these programs are missing a key component, which by the way, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw something come out of Biden's administration. These protect the tenants, but they do nothing to protect the landlords. And I, I think some people have the wrong impression about landlords. The majority of landlords are not huge um, multi, you know, multinational corporations or huge institutional investment companies. Most of them are mom and pops who own five to 10 units. They don't have the financial wherewithal to get through this. So there's two things that... Uh, that uh, uh, well, 85% still own less than two. Yes. Two or less. It, it, it's it's a it's it's a my, my point is it's a mom and pop right uh, investment group. They don't have the finances to weather this kind of storm. So we either need something that provides those landlords a backstop, or we need another stimulus program. Because what was amazing to me and continues to be amazing is how many tenants continue to pay their rent through the recession, through the pandemic, and even after the first stimulus program was was gone. We're, we're only off nationally by whatever numbers I can find by about 2% uh, year over year, which is just mind boggling. So my belief is that if we saw a second stimulus program go out to affected workers, that would effectively backstop the landlords because people are using that money to pay their rent. Yeah, I mean, I've been fortunate. I'm still at 100% um, payment rate throughout the pandemic. Um, almost 50% of my leases have actually renewed during the pandemic. And what I believe, not to toot my own horn, but I believe that I provide quality housing. I believe that, I, I mean, my wife and I take pride in um, uh, making sure that these houses are very well taken care of and updated. And so I think now more than ever, I was quoted in DS News Magazine about this a couple months ago, now more than ever, people really value where they live and having a yeah. nice, clean, safe place to stay when they're told to. <laughs> Absolutely true. Absolutely true. So there's a lot on here about discriminatory practices and redlining. I don't want to get too in the weeds on that. I mean, obviously our country has a deep and, 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 and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big issue and has been in the past. Any changes that you think could come out of the administration with regards to uh, their efforts to um, uh, root out discriminatory practices and redlining with it for lenders? A lot of this is about lenders. <clears throat> this is really more for your conventional lending um, market, your Fannie and Freddie loans, uh, those, those types of loans. I think for investors who are typically dealing with private lenders, uh, hard money lenders, the, this kind of regulatory um, blanket won't necessarily cover those loans. Uh, and, and candidly, every time we hear people talking about things like disparate impact, you never hear investors as part of this conversation. It really is more your mainstream bankers. But I think it's I think it's a fair comment that a Biden administration will start to impose more regulatory control. Uh, and, and so your investors are gonna have to watch for 
you know, where they're buying properties that they intend to, to flip or that they intend to rent just because of some, how some of these rules uh, may come to affect them in terms of, of who they're allowed to sell to or who they're allowed to rent to. Uh, you, you don't want to get caught on the, on the bad side of a, an anti-discrimination law. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, a lot of times, <clears throat> these type of things create opportunity. I mean, if, yes. if, if there's going to be increased pressure on lenders to lend in low-income neighborhoods, um, which a lot of this talks about affordable rental housing units in low-income neighborhoods, you know, maybe, you know, so we, we run into appraisal issues in those neighborhoods. Um, we, we run into qualification issues uh, at times because someone may, you know, be an hourly worker that lost their job or, you know, went from being a warehouse clerk at Target to being a, uh, uh, a shipping manager at, you know, Amazon. And now, uh, the, the lender's not translating that. Uh, so, so, I mean, I think, you know, when, when I, when I bring these things up, it's more about let's find the opportunity, right. Uh, and, and avoid the, uh, the quagmire of confusion. Yeah. Again, if you can, if you can target properties <clears throat> that are in underserved communities and, and turn them into affordable units, either for purchase or for rent, I think there will be support for those sorts of things from, from, from this administration. Um, I, I, and, and you're getting into some other areas where they're, they're going to be stimulus program, not stimulus, but support programs for families <clears throat> who are rent challenged right now, which provides more assurance for you as a landlord. If you happen to be in one of those, uh, one of those areas that you're going to get paid, uh, at least something every month, because it's, it's a, a government check. Uh, the one thing I would watch out for is, is, and this was a Bernie Sanders thing. Uh, which may or may not make its way into a Biden administration, but there was talk about taxes on every investment property that, that's flipped, uh, and and it was a significant tax. I forget the exact amount, but it was double digits for sure. It was in the thirty percent tile range, and and that that could have a significant impact on your ability to profitably sell a a property that you're, you're going to try and buy and flip. Yeah, and that so will also, that will also have some terrible unintended consequences in the market, but. We'll save that for another day. Another solution looking for a problem, as you say. Yep. Uh, you know, so the next section, if people want to read, talks about the $15,000 uh, advanceable tax credit. Uh, talks about uh, increased Section 8 housing vi vouchers so people don't have to pay more than 30% of their rent um, for housing. Um, estimated to impact 17 million low-income families. Like you said, a lot of this is going to have to do with multifamily, but it, 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 what we see with the Dallas Housing Authority and the housing authorities around here is typically what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and anything that applies to multifamily does indeed apply to single family as well. Um, uh, renter's tax credit, um, let's see. Housing benefits for first responders, public school educators. You know, I love renting houses to uh, police officers, firefighters, teachers, nurses. Um, we've got a great deal of those occupants in our rental properties. Uh, and um, hey, you, have I, read, you have to read the whole sentence though there, Tim, because <clears throat> the benefits only apply to those people if they commit to living in persistently impoverished communities. So they, they've got to actually be a first responder who works in a, an underserved community neighborhood. Um, and part of the government program is to provide affordable loans to help them fix up their property. So it's a, it's an attempt to help these kind of workers attain home ownership, um, but also to, to use some government funds to improve the state of those neighborhoods. And what about this? Create a public credit reporting agency. Have you read about this? I have not read about that one. So okay, I, that would be interesting. Uh, cause I can't stand the credit bureaus. Right. Uh, <laughs> so I would love them to go out of business. I'm tired of fighting with them. Uh, I'd rather fight with the government. Um, yeah. So I, I think, you know, they're, they're, this is probably, uh, they're looking a hundred billion dollars in affordable housing fund to construct, uh, affordable housing. Um, I, I guess, I mean, you're probably going to have to be a big developer to take advantage of something like that. Um, very, very likely, which is also a shame because as, as 
difficult as it would be for the government to facilitate something that included hundreds or even thousands of small developers, they'd probably get more bang for their buck doing it. Uh, and you'd have more, um, more of a positive effect on local communities, but it's probably gonna be a big developer program. And, and the other, the, the good news about that is that at least we're not hearing that the government's gonna go and be the developer themselves. Uh, every attempt we've ever had in history of government built and managed uh, residential properties has been an unmitigated disaster. So at least it seems like we've learned from that. Right. So I won't continue down this rabbit hole of the website, but I uh, highly recommend people read it. Um, let's see. Let's talk about um, one of the last times we spoke, um, you talked about commercial real estate, malls, things of that nature. Um, and I was reading last week, I think industrial space, distribution space, warehouse space, what a great investment in my mind, but office space and mall space, I mean, it just gives me a little bit of the heebie-jeebies right now. Well, that's because you have good instincts. Um, I have more heebie-jeebies about the retail market than I do about office. Um, but office is, office is the great unknown. So the industrial market has had something of a mini boom and will probably continue to be really healthy because uh, Amazon and Walmart and everybody else who sells online has found holes in their supply chain and they're looking for places they can build warehousing and distribution centers. Or in Amazon's case, they're going out and buying former JCPenney stores and converting them from storefronts into distribution hubs uh, because they want to get closer and closer to that end customer. Uh, we also, because more people are working from home, have an increased need for cloud computing. So you're seeing a lot of industrial centers converted to cloud computing facilities. So industrial is doing really well. We talked a little bit about the apartment uh, sector, and I, I think there will be some short-term pain followed by long-term growth once we get through this whole, how do we deal with temporary eviction bans and, and getting people to pay rent and all that stuff. But I think short-term pain followed by long-term progress. Uh, the two areas I'm most concerned with, candidly, are retail and hotel. Um, the, the hotel industry, I believe, is running at about 39% occupancy right now, which is off, if I'm not mistaken, by 50 points from a year ago. Uh, it's just a mind-numbingly huge drop. Uh, and as the, the virus spikes again, you're probably going to have people reluctant to travel. So it's just going to take a while before that, that sector bounces back. I can tell you from my days at auction.com that we sold a ton of limited service hotels, your married uh, courtyards and your, your, your Hilton Garden Inns to small investors who just, again, aren't, don't have the capital resources to get through an extended recessionary period. So I, I do expect some problems there. Retail was already struggling before the pandemic. Uh, we've seen household names like uh, Brooks Brothers and, and uh, Black and White and uh, Pier One and, and you know, uh, Gold's Gym and 24-Hour Fitness declare bankruptcy this year. Lots and lots of space opening up. And, and I think suburban malls, particularly in areas with limited population growth, uh, are, are suffering the most. Um, there's an opportunity to repurpose a lot of these places, but it takes time, money, and in a lot of cases, zoning variances to get through through local regulatory issues. So I, I think as much as we've seen on the commercial side, retail operations being sort of salvaged by creative reuse, uh, turning them into entertainment and lodging and business offices in addition to retail, there's, there's only so much capacity to be able to do that. Um, so I, I, I do think retail is going to suffer. And I think small retail will suffer. There, there are just a lot of small businesses that aren't going to be able to get through another shutdown or, or weren't able to get through the last shutdown. Uh, so you're going to have a lot of those kind of facilities pop up. We are seeing a little bit of an increase at realty track in the number of commercial properties coming through for foreclosure. Um, the office space is kind of a mixed bag. I, two things. One, you could have more people working from home permanently, or at least working from home more of the time on a permanent basis. So you're going to have less need for office space in, in terms of the number of workers. But you are going to have a requirement for more space per worker. It turns out 
that during a pandemic, having everybody sit mashed up next to each other in a long table probably isn't the safest way to do things. So we might see that. The other is I, I believe we're gonna see a migration, we're already seeing it from center city business districts to suburban areas where major corporations are, are looking now at more of a hub and spoke model than having everybody come into the same location. Uh, and, and Mark Zuckerberg made the point at Facebook, which is sort of your prototypical Silicon Valley company that you know might make sense for him to have employees in Omaha with a small office facility in Omaha. So he's not paying everything in terms of Silicon Valley real estate prices and, and Silicon Valley salaries. So I, I think you'll see more of that kind of distributed workforce going forward. That'll provide opportunities in smaller markets, but it may, may result in a bit of a downturn in some of the bigger urban areas. So I see your whiteboard on your uh, bedroom wall. Uh, <laughs> when, when do you guys get to go back to the office? We are, um, we were going to do a soft opening this month for anybody who wanted to come in. We are waiting, they had to get away from the kids for a while. Um, we are waiting to see if the governor puts another lockdown in place for quote unquote non-essential businesses, which may be happening imminently. Current plan is that uh, for most of our workers, they're gonna be able to work from home forever. Yeah. and, I, and I I'm just seeing so much of that. And, and uh, I know, um, I don't want to say who, there's a gentleman that I'm rather close with that uh, is retiring next year. And uh, it looks like he may be retiring from his couch because uh, they've been told that, you know, it's going to be at least April or May before they come back to the office because they're a large company that has offices in multiple States and even internationally. And so, it's kind of that one size fits all policy, right? You, yep. you, you can't open your Texas office if your New York headquarters is closed. So, uh, you know, how, how do you, how do you work that? So I, it's interesting. You said, uh, I, I think, I think you'll see a lot of people that are told you can stay home if you want to, which yep. how awesome is that with regards to, we were already approaching a very mobile workforce, but, uh, now, if you can live, you know, in the middle of West Texas and work for Realty Track, I mean, that's a little bit better, I think. Uh, well, I think the big problem that companies had prior to this was they didn't trust their employees to be as productive at home as they were in a more controlled environment. When the issue was forced on everybody, you actually found out if your employees could be productive. And, and in our case, apparently the productivity went up. Um, you know, I, 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 I rejoined Realty Track back in August and I've physically only met one of the people I work with on the Realty Track team. We do everything online, uh, you know, we Zoom meetings, but, and we have a, a great chemistry and we all get along together. We work together really well, but I've, I've physically, literally only met one of my teammates. Wow. Um... Yeah. So hotels or no. So we have a um, Airbnb property we bought in San Antonio and it's I mean, it, This property has been so bad. It's going to be a book all on its own. Uh, <laughs> you know, living in Dallas and, and dealing with San Antonio contractors has been quite the experience, but we were originally going to Airbnb it. And then Airbnb in April, May seemed to be dying. Uh, but then I've looked at a lot of data over the last three to four months. It looks like anyone that does need to travel or want to travel is really opting for the private household experience where, you know, there may have been 10 people there within the last couple of weeks versus a thousand at the hotel. Um, so that, I mean, that's a, that's a space I'm personally becoming more bullish on, um, any thoughts on Airbnb from your, your yeah, chair? This is actually, this is one of the areas I think I guessed wrong on, and I'm, I'm, I'm man enough to admit it. Um, I actually believe when people started traveling again, they would have more faith in a Hyatt or a Marriott uh, or a Hilton to have kind of professional cleaning standards in place uh, and be more sanitary than somebody you don't know who's renting out a house. 
uh, and who knows if they're even local, if even they know who's cleaning the property. Uh, but one of the things I hadn't counted on was people are traveling more, but they're traveling shorter distances. They're looking for kind of staycations almost. Right. So Airbnb properties happen to be located in a lot of those areas where people are going. And it's just been really convenient for those travelers to, to go there. And I think you're right. I think the psychology has been, there may have been five to 10 people here last week, but there weren't 500 to 1,000. So the odds are I'm, I'm better able to, to do well in this environment than in a bigger environment. So I, 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 think, I, I think we've seen the Airbnb market turn around from what looked like it was going to be devastating. Yeah, it's, it, it's been interesting for me because when I travel down to San Antonio, it's just so much easier to stay in an Airbnb and, you know, get my, went in the depth of the pandemic, you know, I'd have my bottle of Lysol and I'd go in and spray down everything I had to touch. And, uh, but you only had to do it once, right? You didn't have to then go down through the lobby and stand in an elevator with a mask with someone and, and, and all the uh, intricacies that go into, and, and even, I used to love staying at hotels that had a bar, right? The mm -hmm. day is over, go down to the bar, watch some TV, strike up a conversation. Well, now I have zero interest in doing that with people that have been traveling. Right. <laughs> so uh, that now it's like, well, I would rather pick up a 12 pack and go and put it in an empty refrigerator and I guess talk to myself. Uh, it, it's 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 much more entertaining than you can you can always zoom me in and we'll have a we'll have a, a virtual <laughs> bar conversation and we'll complain about football. Absolutely. Well, Rick, there is, there's um, no football season this year. There is no yeah. football. season. <laughs> We're ending the end of our time. Um, I'll just say personally what I think, and then I'd love to hear your kind of summation. I feel like the recession came and went. Um, I feel like this housing crash, you know, they, they, they talk about periods of, of housing growth. And I, I just feel like this was a, th that our horrible April and May was the housing crash or recession that we've been waiting for. And so I feel like personally with low interest rates, a affordable housing uh, oriented administration and all the equity, and I agree with you. I just don't think we're going to have much foreclosure activity at all. I mean, definitely not above, I, I can't see it getting back above 2% for anything just because like you said, the equity people have in their houses. And if they're not making money, we tell them they don't have to pay their mortgage and we give them free money and unemployment. So, and their stocks are going way up if they have, you know, tech stocks or anything. So I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like we're in a position akin to 09 and 10, where we're about to see another five to 10 year runway, five to seven year runway. Maybe, and I even think this is like the dot bomb, right? That messed up the housing market a little, but then we had that, you know, massive runaway train to 08 and 09. And I'm not trying to be an alarmist and say seven years from now, we're going to have an 07, but it's just going to be, or 27. Uh, but I, I got to tell you, man, uh, I'm 42 and 50 is looking like a really good time to retire from housing. <laughs> I, I don't, I, it, it's hard to predict another boom because we really haven't had much of a bust. We had, uh, we had March and April that were, were, were weak. Um, May wasn't very, very much either. And I actually did a webinar with somebody who at that point was predicting home sales would be off by 50% at the end of the year. And I, I kind of, I swallowed hard and I didn't agree with him at the time. I certainly don't now. We've, we've actually passed 2019 in terms of, of year to date sales. Um, I think a lot depends on how soon we get the virus more or less under control and what the economy does in terms of coming back. Uh, we had a 32% drop quarter over quarter in GDP, then we had a 33% increase. That sounds like we're back to normal, but we're not because you had to claw your way back up. And, and now the, the growth rate has slowed down pretty significantly. We're still growing, but, but much more slowly. 
So do we come out of this with, you know, unemployment being at 7% instead of three and a half? Um, is it all among renters? Or, you know, do we start seeing those, those layoffs at Boeing start to have an effect on, on homeowners? Um, so there, there's a lot of variables, but what I don't see is a housing crash. And what I don't see is a foreclosure tsunami. A wave, sure. Uh, over the next couple of years, we'll see more defaults than we would have seen otherwise. Um, but everything else uh, points to a strong housing market for the next few years, at least. Well, I personally think we're in a period of fake money, fake how, fake in, uh, economy, fake stocks, fake everything. So everybody gets a house, everybody gets a loan, everybody gets a paycheck, and uh, we'll figure it out in a couple of years. The ultimate, the ultimate example of fake it till you make it. <laughs> Rick, thank you for your time today. Um, Realty Track, how, how do people connect with you? Well, uh, the, the, we, we do have a blog at Realty Track where I, I appear somewhat regularly. We're doing, a, we're doing a free webinar actually on December 9th. You can find information about that uh, at, at the Realty Track blog. Uh, I'll be talking about our outlook for 2021 with my, my friend and yours, Darren Bloomquist. There you go. Watching.com. And, uh, but, but they can also follow me on Twitter at Rick Sharga or uh, find me on LinkedIn and, and, uh, and connect with me there. Excellent, man. Well, continued success and health to you and your family. Um, I hope we beat you in the race to the bottom of the NFC East and get a better draft pick than you. <laughs> Always good talking to you, Tim. Take care. Too, Rick. Thank you. Bye. All right, folks. Again, that was Rick Sharga, Executive Vice President of Realty Track. There's his contact information. There's how you can connect with him. Follow him on Twitter. Find him on LinkedIn. Subscribe to the Realty Track blog. And uh, he always shares good information that is seen through the lens of the real estate professional and real estate investor. And uh, you always want to be the first to know what he has to share. So thank you again for your time. Like I said earlier, please go ahead and ask questions in the comment section of this video. You're finding this video on Facebook and on YouTube and on my blog. And um, if you're listening to it on my podcast, Business and Barbecue Podcast, you can just go down to the uh, show notes and you can click on any of these links, look at the video there and ask questions and my I will answer them, my audience will answer them and um, I'll be asking Rick to pop in and answer them as well. So that's it for me this month. I hope you're staying safe and staying well. Um, use common sense, wash your hands, wear a mask when you're in a crowded place, um, respect other people's uh, point of views, and uh, stay focused on what it is you want to be successful. So that's it, folks. Until next time, keep cooking.